mystical philosophy and theology present us with a seemingly unsurmountable paradox. On the one hand, the gulf between our finitude and the divine infinitude seems, well, impossible to cross. It, it's infinite. On the other hand, there is a profound nostalgia for the absolute, a positive burning passion to reach through that very vast infinity and rejoin the one, the beautiful, and the good. That paradox has motivated some of the most powerful philosophical and mystical speculation in history, resulting in a range of potential solutions. One of the more extraordinary is that we must cross that infinite gulf by engaging in complex rituals which purify us before making us a kind of co-deity with the divine perpetuator of reality, eventually resulting in identity with the divine itself, or henosis. This solution is known as theurgy and was developed most profoundly by the Syrian Platonic philosopher Iamblichus. In this episode, I want to explore the philosophy behind theurgy, why it developed and its lasting impact even today into Christian sacramentalism. If you're interested in magic, hermetic philosophy, alchemy, Kabbalah, or the history of the occult, make sure to subscribe here to Esoterica and check out my other content on topics in esotericism, included curated playlists. Also, if you want to support this kind of work of making accessible, scholarly, and yet free content on topics in esotericism here on YouTube, I'd hope you consider taking a look at my Patreon, maybe a one-time donation with PayPal, you can use the super thanks option below the video. You can also just buy like a pretty boss black metal esoterica shirt over at our merch channel. So check that out as well. But now let's turn to the philosophy of theurgy as developed by Iamblichus, a true theologian of Hellenic pagan spirituality. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge. Welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. Now, to be sure, this episode is not meant to be an introduction to the overall philosophy of Iamblichus, much less an introduction to Neoplatonism more generally. I'm going to assume a fair bit of familiarity with Platonic philosophy, and specifically Plotinus's uptake of it, but to see why, how, and to what end Iamblichus developed the concept of theurgy, we need to appreciate how he read philosophy in a general way, how he read philosophical texts, the tensions that existed in the world of late classical Platonism, because he definitely didn't agree about much, and how those tensions have their roots actually in Plato's own philosophical corpus. When in doubt, blame Plato. By the time of Iamblichus, this is about 240 to 320 of the Common Era, it's important to note that there was a trend in philosophy toward what is sometimes referred to as the greater and the lesser harmonies. The Lesser Harmony argued, strangely, all this is very strange for people who've ever studied contemporary Plato and Aristotle, that both Plato and Aristotle's works represented an internally coherent philosophical system that was complete and without contradiction. That is to say, it did not represent any historical development or intellectual development in its pages. There was virtually no concept, as we basically take for granted now, that Plato's works can be divided into early, middle, and late, marked by distinct internal intellectual development. Now, even stranger, the greater harmony argued that both Plato and Aristotle together represented a single coherent philosophical system, simply stressing different topics or philosophical angles in their approach. Not that Aristotle was a decisive break with Plato because he was that. In effect, Plato and Aristotle both functioned a bit like sacred scripture for someone like Iamblichus, and that's going to really inform how he proceeds. Further, Iamblichus also held that the works of Pythagoras, including what we now recognize as pretty spurious works of 
Pythagoras, along with the Egyptian Hermetic texts and the Chaldean oracles, also operated basically like scriptures. In fact, if we want to typologize all this, because who doesn't like tidy typologies that aren't really true? Iamblichus felt that divine truths about absolute reality had actually been re revealed in ancient times to the Chaldeans and the oracles of their name, the eponymous oracles, to the Egyptians in the Hermetic text or the Hermetic stelae, and to the Greeks via those Hermetic texts, indirectly as enshrined in the philosophy of Pythagoras, Plato, and Aristotle. As you can see, the Greeks actually got their wisdom indirectly from the Egyptians, which they admit to most of the time, and Iamblichus laments the fact that they have further innovated upon it, thus corrupting it from its original pure source. This is a bit like the Islamic notion of bid'ah, or innovation as heresy. Thus, and this is really key, returning to the most archaic and therefore pure source was the only way to retrieve original divine wisdom for someone like Iamblichus. Thus, he's willing to prefer what he takes to be the older, pure, hermetic, or Chaldean wisdom, and will actually use those in some cases to correct upon innovations that have crept up in the Pythagorean, Platonic, and Aristotelian philosophy. Again, which he takes to be a harmonious whole, and he does this by appealing to these more archaic sources. And... He does precisely that when his own teacher and the direct student of Plotinus himself, Porphyry, critiques the role of religious rituals, specifically the admittedly ancient, very ancient Egyptian rituals, in the process of returning to the Divine One, or henosis, the, the very goal of Platonic philosophy. Now, here is a great place to point out that the term Neoplatonism is a totally 18th century category made up in the 18th century and categories while sometimes helpful are never real welcome to nominalism corner unlike say stoicism which despite some real differences from scholark to scholark like between i don't know panitius and posidonius for instance was actually a continuous unified school of philosophical thought and practice which actually really did try to tend toward coherence and sometimes even what we might recognize as orthodoxy. The term Neoplatonism can lure you into thinking the same thing is true from Plato all the way to Plotinus to Damasius and to the very end of the Academy in the 6th century, which actually it lasted a lot longer than that. It really survived out in, into Syria. I see you Syriac academics. But this just isn't true and like many fundamentalist sects, Platonism was marked by dramatic breaks in philosophical continuity, and that's actually most apparent in just how radically Iamblichus will break with his own Platonic inheritance from Plotinus and Porphyry, but also how the later schools, especially the Athenian school, will come to follow Iamblichus over and against Plotinus on many crucial issues. This despite us telling ourselves that Plotinus is the definitive expression of this thing we call Neoplatonism. By the way, Plotinus himself was a pretty decisive break with what we now call Middle Platonism, which was as much Stoic and Neopythagoreanism as it was Platonism. But to get to Iamblichus's philosophy of theurgy, we need to head back to a real very powerful philosophical tension to be found originally in the Platonic corpus itself. Now, that tension is just how to evaluate matter, hule, and by extension, that's a philosophical joke, by extension, how to evaluate the physical body and its ensoulment. The problem is that Plato seems to provide two rather distinct contradictory accounts in this regard. In the Phaedrus, and especially the Phaedo, Plato takes a rather pessimistic account of the body, going so far as to see it as something human beings are cured of when they die. We get cured of the body, it's that bad. Here, the body and matter in general is basically an impediment at best, and, well, it's a sickness that needs to be cured at worst. It's downright evil. In the Timaeus, a slightly more optimistic account is actually given. Here, matter, hule, is still limited in a very important sense, 
but its ensoulment is still the optimal condition on all things told. It's not inherently evil. Thus, the cosmos is created by the Demiurge. It's actually, well, it's kind of optimal despite the limitations of matter. Imagine a potter. No matter how talented and good the potter is, they're always going to be limited by the, well, the quality of the clay they have to work with. And so too the Demiurge of the Timaeus. He's just limited by matter into what, what he can make. Now, resolving this philosophical tension isn't easy, and a great many solutions emerge in the history of Platonic philosophy, sometimes wildly different solutions. The most infamous is the so-called Gnostic solution, where the Demiurge is just rendered ignorant and evil, and so too matter. Matter becomes positively evil. This universe is a prison that we need to escape, thus they really double down on that whole somatic pessimism business. Plotinus actually rejects that position. In fact, I've made a whole episode detailing the philosophical objections that Plotinus makes to Gnosticism, if you want to check that out. It's pretty cool. But still, he has another problem to deal with. If matter and body are the last ontological registers before tattering off into non-being, I always kind of imagine like those old genes you have that drag the floor and tatter off into non-being, that's matter. How do ensouled bodies return to the one at all, especially if the process of ensoulment is so profoundly traumatizing as to erase any, all, any and all knowledge of ever being a soul at all? Something that's part and parcel of Platonic philosophy. His solution is that the soul never fully descends, but remains connected by a tiny tether to the supernal world of the one, the good and the beautiful, and that by turning inward to our true selves as emanations of that divine world, we can begin the metaphysical process of the, the flight of the alone to the alone back to the one, the good, and the beautiful, the process known as henosis. Thus, when we engage in the Socratic know thyself, we're coming to know what we truly are, that is, the remotest region of the flowing out of the divine one. And just as the flow trickles out into the void of non-being, we can employ philosophy to turn the tide, so to speak, and begin the process of returning to the source, thus completing the cycle, the dialectic of progression and regression that really marks out in a really significant way the entire Platinian system. Now, this lands Plotinus and Porphyry more solidly in that somatic pessimism camp, not as pessimistic as the Gnostics, and Porphyry actually relates just how ashamed, ashamed, Plotinus was to be in a body at all. And this stands at real philosophical odds with Plato's account of the cosmos and bodies with it as being optimal in the Timaeus. Honestly, it actually even stands more shockingly at odds with Plotinus' own arguments against the Gnostics where he uses those very arguments from the Timaeus against their pessimism. Get a little pot and kettle here with Plotinus against the Gnostics. Iamblichus very profoundly picks up on this tension and makes a truly decisive break in the philosophical inheritance of Platonism. He rejects that the embodied soul has any connection to the supernal source and is thus fully sunk or enmeshed into the body and the world of matter. But this isn't a fault or some cosmic tragedy, far from it. For Iamblichus, the ensouled body is the ultimate register in the process of emanation itself. Now, his system of emanations is much, much more complicated than the relatively simple process of Plotinus, and I don't have the time to cover it here, but suffice to say, from the supernal world, the entities that emerge in this process are gods, archangels, angels, daimons, heroes, world-ruling archons, material archons, and finally souls. But with a few exceptions, all of these beings are expressions of the goodness of the divine world and are thus just necessary lesser states of being in the symphony of being. I mean, you need the second violins as much as you need the first violin to make a symphony work. The second violins aren't somehow bad. They're part of the whole thing. They're just not as high as the first violins. Even the guy on the triangle matters. Unlike Plotinus, who held that matter was just the last ontological stop before non-being, Iamblichus held that matter was the final 
but only least in a very qualified sense. It's still an expression of the ongoing goodness of the divine, really of the demiurgic gods. There's kind of several demiurgic gods in Yamblica's system. Unlike Plotinus's end of the line, Iamblichus kind of sees it as the ultimate contratension of the process of emanation, and thus the ideal ontological register from which the recession back to the one can really begin in earnest. But how? Only by participating in the co-creative expression with the gods in this material cosmos can we begin to attain henosis, or return to the one. That co-creative expression with the gods, in fact, dependent upon the favor of those gods, actually, is marked by a profoundly religious dimension of devotional acts and not the mere intellectualism of Plotinus and Porphyry. That philosophically informed yet religious devotion which makes the human being co-demiurgic, truly godlike in their god-doing, God doing, thus inaugurating their return to the one, or henosis. That's just what Iamblichus means by theurgy, God doing. Now, remember a moment ago when I said that Plotinus' student, Porphyry, actually Iamblichus' teacher, attacked the role of religious rituals, specifically the Egyptian rituals in the overall Platonic process of henosis? Well, in a sense, that's part of a long tradition of Platonic intellectualizing and even, frankly, religious antinomianism. Recall that Plato himself argued for censoring the myths and even, you know, just making up new ones like the myth of the metals to control the population in the Republic. He even upset the traditional role of women in the state in the Republic, you know, gave them a role at all, along with understanding religious rituals primarily along intellectual lines. Honestly, it is not surprising to me in the least that the Platonists were hounded as something akin to ancient heretics by the conservative Hellenian establishment. I mean, Plato was ultimately a cosmic monotheist who held that mathematical principles were ontologically primary. Ditto. Aristotle held that a fundamentally unified, unmoved mover composed of pure mental activity was the source of all causation in the cosmos. Plotinus and Porphyry more or less they carried that tradition straightforward, paying some lip service to the traditional cult, but ultimately arguing that only an intellectual, an inward intellectual turn could ultimately prove redemptive. Porphyry himself went so far as to publish arguments against animal sacrifice and for vegetarianism. A positive outrage against the religious core of Hellene ritual life. And when Porphyry attacked the extraordinarily ancient cult of the Egyptians, even by Greek standards extraordinarily ancient, Iamblichus just seemed to have had enough of it. His counteroffensive against his own teacher, and really the hitherto history of Platonic religious antinomianism, was his reply to a Porphyry in a text that we now know as the De Mysteriis. That's the Latin title given by Ficino in the Renaissance when he translated it. Now, I'm not even going to try to attempt a summary of the De Mysteries in this episode. It's honestly an extraordinarily complex text, which is just full of philosophical insider baseball. It assumes a sophisticated understanding of philosophy up to that point, the inner workings of debates within Platonic philosophy specifically, the religious and ritual landscape of the time, and the particular elements of Porphyry's mostly lost criticism of Egyptian rituals. So, you know that I usually recommend people just, you know, dive into primary text, whatever possible, but I gotta be frank with you, this one's gonna, you're gonna need swimming lessons before you dive into this one. For what it's worth, I'm going to be focusing in this episode specifically on the placement of the soul in Iamblichus' system and the role theurgy allows for it to attain or retain henosis, and even then... I can't possibly cover everything, especially as it's laid out in the hundreds of fragments of Iamblichus and the very complex uh, text of De Mysteries. For Iamblichus, as I mentioned earlier, the soul is fully enmeshed in the cosmos, the material world, specifically in the material human body. Given its downward trajectory, it tends toward 
materiality toward things material, beautiful people, as opposed to beauty itself. And it's marked by a kind of weakness and imperfection, and it even seems to flicker at times, almost into non-being, like one of those old neon signs in film noir movies or something. Further, the soul is firmly on a lower ontological register than the intellect. However, and despite the lower stature of the soul in this system, it alone is able to become activated by the gods in the process of henosis. The intellect is not going to play the primary role here. While the intellect can recognize the plight of the soul, and even jumpstart the process of enosis through abstraction, especially mathematical abstraction, neither the intellect nor the soul on their own can mount up higher than our station in the cosmos without the aid of the gods. That's crucially important. Without the aid of the gods. They're just that ontologically alienated. The gods for Iamblichus are equal parts person deities, they are very much person deities, as well as philosophical principles whose appearance or epiphanies in various cultures vary considerably, but who are fundamentally united metaphysically. Thus is complete comfort with homologizing between the pantheons of the Greeks, the Egyptians, and the Chaldeans. Now, rather than beginning the process of enosis by an intellectual turning to the true self, as in Plotinus, Iamblichus argues that the intellect recognizes the goodness of the cosmos as an expression of unity, goodness, and beauty, like a faint reminder of their origin in the One. Thus, as in souled bodies, our first task is to intellectually, intellectually recognize this goodness and beauty and oneness using the tools of philosophy. More on that in just a moment. But our real task, our real task, is to take up the ritual actions which make us co-demiurgical with the very God which produce that very oneness, good, goodness, and beauty in this world. We become co-demiurges. When we do so, with the proper devotion, the gods will thus manifest themselves to us, and our souls thus reversing the downward flow of emanation from procession to recession, and allow us, through the grace of the gods, to mount up to the one via henosis. Those ritual acts which stimulate, stimulate but do not cause, no human action can compel the gods. This is very important for Iamblichus. Attempting to compel the gods to do anything is a big no-no in his system. Which stimulate the gods to this graceful epiphany and the road to henosis, all of that is for Iamblichus his concept of theurgy. Thus, Iamblichus maintains three distinct registers. Philosophy, which is logical and discursive. Theology, God talk, which is discursive, but whose origins are actually super logical. And theurgy, which is neither bound by logic nor expressive discursively at all. The De Mysteriis captures this distinction really well. He argues philosophically in the text. He discusses theology systematically but it has its origins in the non-discursive experience of religious revelations, of various kinds of experiences, such as rituals, sacrifice, divination, the epiphanies, or the appearances by supernatural beings. And yes, while it's now in vogue, for whatever reason, to argue that the idea of the supernatural has its origins in Abrahamic religious conceptions or early modern Christian conceptions of a natural and a supernatural world, this concept really originates in Iamblichus, for whom the gods, daemons, heroes, etc. literally exist huperfusis. That's the word, that's the word he uses. They're above nature. So ontologically, just above this physical cosmos, and thus their appearance as an epiphany is just literally supernatural in character. Literally, huperfusis. Ditto the results of true divination, the transformation of sacrifices for the gods, and other kinds of manifestations of divine power in our cosmos, otherwise ruled well by the Aristotelian rules of the four causes, the Aitia. In fact, those supernatural manifestations are both the proof that your theurgy is working, but also the very means by which your soul begins the process of ascent. So how do we know how to perform theurgy? Well, the good news Good news is that the gods have emanated the cosmos in such a manner as to implant within it various symbola, or symbols, 
are suntimata, or signatures, or tokens, which can be activated by intentional acts of devotion. How? Because the cosmos is a unity linked by a system of harmonies, or sympathies, sympatheia, an idea actually coming in from Stoicism in a way. You can check out my video on how important Stoicism is for the history of the occult philosophy if you want to. It's an incredibly important role that doesn't get enough attention. One can activate a particular connection to the upper world from the lower world, which begins the process of spiritual purification and eventually spiritual ascent back to the one. There are three primary types of suntimata or symbola, symbols or signatures in the cosmos. The material, the intermediate, and the noetic. The material one is our natural substances of objects which form a kind of metaphysical connective tissue with the upper realms. For instance, this is a relationship of certain metals and herbs and gems and incense and even sacrificial animals for Iamblichus with the various daimons, heroes, and gods that are sort of the bridge between us and the One. Thus, by properly enacting this relational connection via devotional acts and the correct intentions, it can inspire or stimulate grace to begin to flow unto oneself from those very upper beings. Now, some of these relationships are rather intuitive, while others are known and revealed only by those higher beings. So some you can figure out just by observing the natural world, and others have to be revealed. So for instance, you can notice that silver and the moon sort of bear a resemblance, and you can perhaps begin to build primitive rituals around that. That's an example of a metal, which has a kind of suntimata relationship. The second type of these are the intermediate, and these are visual symbols and vocal expressions. The visual symbols can be physical depictions of the gods or otherwise visual depictions of the deities to which devotion can be made, especially meaning-laden symbolic representations. Iamblichus is kind of torn on direct representations of the gods. He likes more symbolic ones. The vocal intermediate forms of theurgy are the use of natural language in the form of hymns of devotion to the gods, They're all about hymns, but also the long strings of nomina barbara, including the vowel strings and palindromes, along with all kinds of other non semic phonic streams of ritual power. Of course, these various nomina barbara are widely attested in the ancient world from various texts like the Greek magical pari, the hermetic literature, and the Gnostic literature. So these kind of nomina barbara are ways of reconnecting with the gods kind of irrationally or hyper-rationally. Now, speaking of the Greek magical papyri, I should probably mention what he has to say about sorcery at this point, and the answer is no. He rejects any form of sorcery, which he actually associates with standing upon magical signs or characteris, along with various other practices. For Iamblichus, one can harness the various powers of nature, or even the divinely left signatures, to actually act against nature itself, thus causing events in nature that shouldn't otherwise happen. It's unnatural. Note these manifestations are contra-natural, not supernatural. Such sorcerers employ these contra-natural feats, not in the interest of henosis, becoming one with the god, but in their own mucky, selfish interests, like winning horse races or forcing people to have sex with them or gaining wealth and honor. Not only does this ego-driven, selfish endeavor further enmesh their souls in their bodies, but it also attracts malevolent beings, which seek to further manipulate those sorcerers and goes, often dooming them. In this way, Iamblichus and Augustine are actually surprisingly on the same page, even for kind of similar reasons. These are quasi-theurgical acts not done for the greatest good, though with very different targets in mind. Iamblichus and Augustine would have not gotten along. So, no. Iamblichus is a no for sorcery, but theurgy does provide the theurgists with a very similar kind of set of outcomes in the end. For instance, successful divination, levitation, and even the ability to summon daimons, all of which were actually ascribed to Iamblichus in the hagiographic literature that developed after he died, though he was admittedly reluctant to perform these feats of power out of his own sense of humility and devotion to the gods. Again, these are accounts of devotion, not showing off to your homies that you can summon a water daimon. Don't show off your theurgical powers because you will lose them.
and the other daimons will kill you. Finally, the noetic forms of theurgy are the most mysterious. Iamblichus just doesn't seem to say much about them. They're just beyond all discursive and logical power, though they appear to have been quite advanced and maybe have something to do with the intellect, noesis perhaps, given that the intellect first stimulates the possibility of theurgy by noticing those various kinds of cosmic connections, I suspect that noetic theurgy is maybe the final combination of the spiritual and the intellectual, something I again suspect but I don't know, that is perhaps related to the mathematical spirituality a la Pythagoreanism, meditating perhaps on the ultimate most abstract ontological nature of the cosmos as the dialectic of the one, the hen, the limit, the paros, and the unlimited, the, the aperon, are perhaps other internal unities of opposites which are productive tensions by which Iamblichus actually argues being itself, or at least being in this realm, emerges, and how being actually proceeds through a kind of internal dialectic of these mathematical opposites. These might again be indirectly tied to the Pythagorean mathematical mysticism which formed the core of Plato's otherwise mysterious secret teachings that I've, you know, can be mentioned in his letters. Kind of, you can check out my episode on what little we can say about those secret Platonic teachings, but I suspect that this noetic theurgy probably has to do with some kind of inner Pythagorean mathematical mysticism, but we don't, just don't know. However, such theurgical practices do their work by purifying both the body and the soul. Again, the body is important in this process. They prepare the mind for participation in the upper worlds, mostly by untethering it from our otherwise confused state of consciousness, and they finally enable our ability to commune with the gods before achieving ultimate henosis, becoming one, communing with the divine. Thus, as a being emanated from the innermost one as the holy, unspeakable principle through the myriad ontological registers down to our ensouled body, this ultimate contratension to be turned back to the one, first by a kind of intellection, but really and ultimately and really only through diversion via theurgy. So, what were these? theurgic rituals. Iamblichus does give us some glimpses onto them in the De Mysteries, but recall describing them isn't worth the effort. They must be experienced first and foremost. There's no philosophizing or describing. This is not anthropology. So he's not going to prepare us as a theurgical manual in the De Mysteries, but as a philosophical defense of theurgy and its central role for henosis. This is not a manual for theurgy. Though clearly Iamblichus was a bit of a traditionalist and believed that the cultic rituals of the Egyptians, the Chaldeans, and the Greeks, such as the oracles, were theurgically powerful and they functioned as part of henosis. Again, because all three, and probably all cultures, built their theurgical practices around similar experiences of the shared gods as filtered through their own cultural matrices. Again, remember, we have a Syrian Chaldean person, Iamblichus, using Greek philosophy to defend the traditional Egyptian cult practices as theurgical in De Mysteriis. In that way, this is an extraordinary text from a religious studies point of view as well. He inhabits three different identities at some level as he's working through this text. So how does one know when one's theurgy is effective? Well, primarily by supernatural manifestations, especially mantic or prophetic knowledge of the future, acquisition of various kinds of supernatural powers, like being able to levitate, and appearances of supernal beings are epiphanies among other events. These beings show up, and Iamblichus goes to great lengths to describe how they differently appear to us, all of which are beyond language and philosophical argumentation and must be experienced to be understood. But far from being an irrational or anti-rational philosopher, as has actually been argued in years past by folks like Dodds, his religious system is a carefully guided and introduced upon the foundation of logic, argumentation, and mathematical rigor. Far from rejecting rational philosophy, Iamblichus simply argues that philosophy, while foundationally important, it just has limitations that are transversable 
only by theurgy. Thus, philosophy, theology, and theurgy all have very important roles to play in the process of attaining henosis, but Diablicus does ultimately reject the traditional idea from Platonic intellectualism. And interestingly enough, the Athenian Academy would follow him in this, including Proclus and Damasius. So it's theurgy that is salvific in the Iamblichan system. So I think it's important here to reject the notion that Iamblichus is an anti-rational thinker, whatever that means, but also to try to render the De Mysteries as fundamentally a logic text of philosophy is bizarre. Neither of those positions are tenable. Further, I'd argue that Orthodox and Catholic sacramentalism are actually closer to Iamblichus than Plotinus's intellectual spirituality. While philosophy and theology are very important for Catholic and Orthodox Christianity, they're not the least bit salvific. You will not achieve salvation by theology. Further, the substantiation or the transubstantiation of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ are strikingly like the transformation of the sacrifices made by theurgists in Iamblichus, which are transformed from just being mere meat and smoke to something more powerfully spiritual in Iamblichus' analysis. Thus, in my opinion, for what it's worth, if you want to witness the closest thing to real historical continuity of theurgy from the late classical world, just go behold the miracle of transubstantiation at your local Orthodox and Catholic Church. In this sense, Hellenic paganism, as articulated by Iamblichus and Orthodox Christianity, sure share way more in common than they, they want to think, which is often the case. In fact, I'd be surprised if it weren't because of the meteoric success of Christianity with its sacraments and its scriptures that Julian, the apostate, tried to reconstitute a state paganism, a rival state paganism to Christianity with Iamblichus as a prophet, the Chaldean oracles as a kind of scripture, and the state sacrifices as a kind of sacrament. Perhaps, ultimately, the Christians just outpaganed the pagans and beat Iamblichus at his own game, the theurgy game. Not that Christians would admit as much, but I think they just outdid him. Again, Iamblichus' De Mysteriis is our best glimpse into the world of late classical pagan Hellenic ritual, religious ritual, and its philosophical intersection. And while the work is admittedly difficult, it's well worth at least sifting through. I suspect that books two, three, five, and six are going to be the most interesting for folks that watch Esoterica, although, again, the whole book is fascinating. Of course, the literature on Iamblichus is vast and technical. Again, you're going to need to level up your philosophy game to at least seven, ten for this theurgy adventure. Emma Clark, etc., their translation of De Mysteriis with the facing Greek is now the standard academic edition, though if you want to pick up the Thomas Taylor, it's much cheaper and has aged remarkably well. Well done, Thomas Taylor, on everything, frankly. Also, Clark's A Manifesto of the Miraculous is also well worth reading, especially if you're interested in the manifestations of theurgy in Iamblichus, how it appears and how theurgy works in the world. It's a really great text. Shaw's Theurgy in the Soul is necessary reading here as well, especially for his focus on the importance of embodiment and theurgy as demiurgy. It's a real masterpiece, well worth reading. Of course, the Hackett introduction to Neoplatonism by Wallace is incredibly good, but it's really technical, so good luck. And the Dillon Neoplatonism reader is well worth having and working through a couple times, cover to cover, a couple times few times. I've read it a lot. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and thank you for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.